Well, hello, good afternoon. Uh, it's a absolute pleasure for us to see so many of you joining us here at this webinar. Uh, on behalf of the number five course protection team, uh, but in particular from Varsha and myself, we are extremely pleased to be able to put this event on for you. Uh, certainly when I was approached, I asked, I opined perhaps, uh, are people a bit webinared out these days? Clearly the numbers we've got attending are showing me the opposite conclusion can be come to. In particular, it may simply be that people are attracted to webinars, provided that the topics are pertinent. And I hope that today's topics are going to be pertinent to you all. Uh, certainly the topics of sex, contact and COVID, in particular vaccinations, are really hot topics in the court of protection right now and I would anticipate are likely to become even more pertinent as we go into next phases of reductions of restrictions. So hopefully the information that Varsha and I are going to be able to set out for you today will be of assistance in your practices going forward. Uh, indeed as well as pertinent topics I'm sure that useful and interesting speakers will also be a draw to you all. Uh, for that very reason, Varsha has done the majority of the heavy lifting with this particular seminar. So I'm here to welcome you. Uh, Varsha is going to set out uh, some relevant information, some relevant slides that will hopefully be useful to you relating to sex and the Mental Capacity Act and the Court of Protection. I'll then go on to discuss some implications in relation to contact, and then Varsha will wrap up with COVID and vaccinations. We hope to have some time for questions at the end for you as well, hopefully 10 minutes or so, but we do promise to have you away by five o'clock. Uh, what I will say, just two points of housekeeping. Firstly, if you do have any questions for us, we do welcome them. Uh, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we'll do our best to be able to answer them either during the seminar, but if not, then certainly we'll come back to you afterwards. And finally, uh, the slides that Varsha and I are going to share as part of this webinar will be available to you afterwards. They'll be emailed out, so don't feel you need to be screenshotting every single one. Uh, and alongside that will come a feedback form, and we would really welcome your feedback on this seminar and indeed anything else we can do to help going forward. So I think that's probably enough from me from now. As I said, the key speaker is going to be Varsha today, so I'm going to let her take over and share her screen and take you through the interesting and indeed groundbreaking in some uh, respects, a world of the court of protection and the issue of sex. Thanks, Varsha. Thanks, David. So I'm now to go to try and share my screen. Great, so hopefully you're all seeing the slides. Um, shout if you're not in the, um, the chat function. I think David will also give me a, a scary face if I'm not sharing anything. So, um, as, uh, so firstly, good afternoon, everyone, and it's a pleasure to see so many of you here. Um, as David said, I'm going to be providing um, the update on capacity regarding sexual relations. So specifically, I'm going to be looking at the case of JB. Now, this was the Court of Appeal Authority, which was handed down um, in summer of last year. And it did two things. Um, first, it recast the relevant decision as being capacity to engage in sexual relations as opposed to consent to sexual relations. And second, an ally to that, it expanded the relevant information to include the, the consent of the person with whom the sexual relations are being had. Um, so the cases that I'm going to um, talk about are, so firstly, obviously JB, I'll provide a, a recap of what um, was decided in that case. Um, then the case of HG. Now this is a case which came before Mr. Justice Cobb at a turn, around a turn of this year. Um, and then secondly, the case of DY. This is more recent, in fact, um, and this came um, before Mrs. Justice Knowles relatively recently. Also, um, DY looks at the issue of fluctuating capacity regarding um, capacity to engage in sexual relations. So there are the two facets, which are hopefully going to be quite interesting and quite informative. So JB, um, a recap. 
So you'll probably recall that JB is a 36 year old man. He has a complex diagnosis of autistic spectrum disorder with impaired cognition. And he had been living um, in a supported living placement with restrictions on his independence. Uh, and these concerned his access to the community, his contact, his social media and internet use. And those first two categories were really because of his tendency for quite inappropriate behavior towards women. Now, JB really wanted to have a relationship with a girlfriend and he wanted to engage in sexual relations. The only problem was he had consistently demonstrated disinhibited behavior towards women. So for example, he would send repeated unwanted sexually explicit messages to women who had met in dating sites. He had um, a lack of awareness of social boundaries around women, particularly those who were vulnerable uh, and also those who perhaps he might approach in a pub or a club. He also, in, by his own acknowledgement, didn't understand or couldn't quite um, get the reactions of women's reactions to him. And when he received reactions, he was unwilling to um, seek clarification about what those meant. Now, um, the local authorities sought declarations regarding JB's uh, capacity regarding a range of domains and also authorization of his care and support in the community, which would include restrictions on contact with women. Now, with regards to sexual relations, the evidence from a clinical psychologist indicated that JB understood the mechanics of sex, so one of the aspects of relevant information. His, his understanding of consent was lacking and he had a really limited understanding of the emotional state or intentions of others. The psychologist concluded that JB lacked the ability to understand or weigh the importance of ensuring his partner was consenting. And furthermore, if he was unsupported in the community and or returned to a club for people with learning disabilities, there was a high risk that JB would commit a sexual assault in pursuit of trying to have a sexual relationship. The matter came before Mrs. Justice Roberts for hearing. Now, the question she was asked to consider was different um, to the question which the Court of Appeal later considered. And this was whether a person, in order to have capacity to consent to sexual relations, must understand that the other person must consent. Now, the reason that it was put in those terms was because up until that point, reported cases had dealt with it in those terms. But of course, also those cases had not dealt with the scenario which was faced in JB, that where P was effectively initiating and wanted to initiate sexual relations. Mrs. Justice Roberts held that the fact that JB couldn't understand that particular fact didn't mean that he lacked capacity to consent to sexual relations. And she made a declaration regarding uh, that he had capacity in that particular domain. The local authority subsequently appealed and it went to the, the Court of Appeal before Lord Justice Baker, Singh and also Sir Andrew McFarlane. Lord Justice Baker gave the uh, sole judgment in this. He said, the fundamental decision is whether to engage in sexual relations. Giving consent is only part of decision making. He explained, it's JB who wishes to initiate sexual relations with women. The capacity in issue in the present case is therefore JB's capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations. And Lord Justice Baker subsequently held, in my judgment, this is how the question of capacity with regard to sexual relations should normally be assessed in most cases. It followed in his view that the information relevant to the decision inevitably included the fact but any person with whom P engages in sexual activity must be able to consent to that activity and does in fact consent. So there are two aspects to it. He summarised at paragraph 100 the information relevant to decision. He said that this may include the following and you'll be familiar with uh, many of the items on this, on this list and the additional elements and provided um, in JB of those in red at point two. With regards to the use of his word may, that the relevant information may include the following. And um, this was um, in recognition that there is discourse as to whether or not um, 
the matters identified always have to be included. Unfortunately, Lord Justice Baker didn't address that particular question. And the reason for that, he said, was because it didn't arise in that, um, the present appeal. And therefore, anything that he said, or the court said, would not be binding. And so, therefore, the court refrained from doing so. The outcome was that the declaration um, that JB had capacity to consent to sexual relations was set aside. And, Mr. and Lord Justice Baker remitted the matter to Mrs Justice Roberts for reconsideration. Now, as of April 2021, um, JB, who is represented by the official solicitor, has been granted permission to appeal to the Supreme Court. Now, I'm not aware of when that hearing is listed or the grounds of appeal, but um, safe to say this is clearly an evolving landscape. Moving then to the first case, which really grapples with uh, JB, and that's the case of HD uh, before Mr. Justice Cobb. So this involved um, a woman in her late twenties. She had a learning disability of mild severity. The issue in this case was whether she had capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations. Um, of relevance, she was currently in a relationship with someone who was turned Z. He too had a learning disability and lived with his mother. At that particular time, due to coronavirus restrictions, they were only speaking in a phone, although apparently when conversations were overheard, they were sometimes mildly sexual in content. Nonetheless, HD had stated that she wanted to live with Zed and also to have unsupervised time with him when she moved into her own flat, which was going to happen in due course. The positions of the parties was as follows. The local authority considered that the presumption of capacity was not rebutted, i.e. that HD had capacity. The official solicitor was somewhat more circumspect and said that the presumption was, or was likely to be rebutted. The specific issue highlighted was that HD did not appear to understand that a sexual partner must in fact consent before and throughout the sexual activity. And furthermore, must have capacity to consent to sexual activity. So there's two aspects again. The court heard all the evidence and actually by the end of that evidence, the local authority agreed um, that HD did currently lack capacity. So what happened during this evidence? The court heard from um, HD social workers and also jointly instructed expert um, who was a clinical psychologist. First, looking at the social worker's evidence, uh, Miss A. So she uh, was clear that HD demonstrated an understanding of the mechanics of the act of sex, the fact it could lead to pregnancy or an STI, the different forms of contraception. She also referred to um, discussions with HD about the need for HD to consent and also for her partner to consent. However, it was acknowledged that her, her assessment didn't cover the question of HD's ability to understand that her partner also needed to have capacity to consent. Now, she was asked about this by Mr Justice Cobb in her oral evidence, and she took the view that HD would not be able to form an understanding of someone else's capacity to engage in sexual relations. She hoped, however, that HD could acquire the capacity to learn this, but she recognised it would be difficult um, to think about this in the abstract, given uh, HD's learning disability. Dr. Carrot Baker, who was a clinical um, psychologist, also uh, gave evidence. Now, he identified what he thought was a problem in assessing whether HD or someone in HD's position has capacity to engage in sexual relations. He wrote, the test makes more sense when one has capacity but when two people, as in this situation, may lack capacity, we get into the problem of circularity. We are asking the question of both parties and each party must make some appraisal of the other's capacity to consent. Dr. Carrot Baker was of the view that HD herself was only just over the line in understanding her own capacity to consent. He was of the view that HD would not be able to achieve an understanding of the need to assess the capacity of a partner's decision to engage in and consent in sexual relations. He thought this was simply beyond her ability. 
and he was very doubtful about the role of education and whether it could help her to process this more abstract uh, concept. Given the evidence from Miss A and also Dr. Uh, Carrot Barker, the uh, judge, Mr. Justice Cobb, um, was driven to the conclusion in his view that although she understood the need for a partner to consent to engage in sexual relations, it was clear from the evidence that she couldn't currently understand the need for that same partner to have capacity to consent. He was clear to say that if this had been decided by him, perhaps before the Court of Appeal um, judgment in JB, he would likely have reached the opposite conclusion, i.e. that HD had capacity. As it was, he came to the conclusion that HD lacked capacity to engage in sexual relations, given this particular aspect of the relevant information. There was discussion um, in the court as to whether or not this relevant information, which had been summarised in JB at paragraph 100, could be tailored or perhaps parts of it disapplied. However, the official solicitor accepted and the court agreed that the circumstances of this case didn't warrant um, any such tailoring. And therefore, there was no proper basis for the court to try and distinguish HD's case. Everyone recognising that, of course, this was going to lead to very significant consequences, both for HD and her partner. Mr. Justice Cobb did have some, perhaps uh, limited, but well, some optimism of sorts, in the sense, whilst recognising there was a difference of view between the professionals regarding the role of education, he considered there was nothing to be lost and possibly much to be gained by trying to provide HD with a package of further education to see if she could so learn this particular aspect uh, and therefore um, considered that it would be useful for this to go forward uh, in the future. A final aspect which was um, ventilated perhaps in the court um, on behalf of the official solicitor, um, this was leading counsel, it was the interface between the court of protection and the criminal law. The court was asked to consider consent in the criminal um, justice system so where effectively there is rape, where the alleged perpetrator does not have a reasonable belief that a partner consents. It was argued that the anomaly may arise where someone who is capacitous may lawfully reasonably believe that a partner has capacity to consent to sex and does in fact consent as a matter of criminal law. Whereas in the context of welfare proceedings in the court of protection, P must understand, retain, weigh, etc that her partner must have capacity to engage in sex. This was argued to be a heightened civil test, and it was said that in the Court of Appeal had not explained why there was this test in um, the Court of Protection, which went beyond that required by the criminal law. A very, very interesting point. Um, and Mr. Justice Cobb acknowledged that, but then said he didn't need to address it because it didn't arise on his, these particular issues, and therefore there was no need for him to determine it whilst noting that perhaps it perhaps stood to be determined um, on other facts. So this particular case of HD is particularly um, interesting because it raises, um, we're seeing how the relevant information added to by JB is playing out effectively on the ground. And in particular, the difficulties that might be caused by this need to understand that the other person must have capacity to consent. How does that work in, in, real, in real life? Um, how is P's ability to assess that? What are we asking of P? And it's quite possible that it's going to cause significant difficulties for those who, who do have certain cognitive um, uh, deficits, such as learning disabilities, um, where there are struggles with more abstract concepts. It's heartening to see Mr. Justice Cobb try and see that perhaps it could be a way through this, for example, with the use of education. Moving then to the um, second case of DY. Um, so this was um, a young lady who had just turned 18 and she had um, various diagnoses, um, for example, two chromosomal duplicities, a moderate learning disability, and it's all set out there. Now, there was permission for Dr. Cameron Smith to provide an assessment of DUI's capacity in a, uh, various domains. And there was actually agreement on a lot of those as to uh, where she lacked capacity and where she had capacity. 
The only issue was her capacity to engage in sexual relations. Uh, and DY was in a relationship with a man, AB, who did not have learning difficulties. Um, the positions of the parties regarding her ability to engage in sexual relations was as follows. The local authority was of the view that her capacity effectively fluctuated. So when she was settled or in a familiar situation of surroundings, she was able to make a capacitous decision. When she was unsettled or distressed, she couldn't. The local authority therefore sought a prospective declaration to that effect, alternatively, a declaration in identical terms or similar terms pursuant to the inherent jurisdiction. The official solicitor was of the view that DY had capacity to decide to engage in sexual relations, full stop. Now, it's worth noting that both parties actually were taking a position contrary to the report of Dr. Camden Smith, who initially had come to the view that DY lacked capacity. The reason being that she apparently had good knowledge of consent within a relationship, but didn't appear to understand consent outside a relationship. It was suggested to her on behalf of the official solicitor that was perhaps a bar too high, and she conceded in oral evidence that perhaps it was. Dealing with the local authority's position regarding fluctuating capacity and a prospective declaration, this was roundly rejected by Mrs Justice Knowles for a number of reasons. The first was that the law in this area regarding sexual relations requires assessment on a general non-specific basis, and we are all familiar with that, it being act-specific, not um, person-specific. And that applies, however, not just to the identity of the partner, but also the timing and circumstances of the decision. And that would capture, for example, DY being upset or unsettled. Secondly, the local authority didn't actually advance any standards by which DY's distress or upset could be judged in order to determine whether or not she had capacity to engage in sexual relations. Council for the local authority um, did try to argue that the words upset, distress, um, were sufficiently descriptive, but Mrs Justice Knowles did not agree uh, and said it simply wasn't clear at which point the local authority was saying that DY would lack capacity. Thirdly, um, she came to the view that prospective declarations in this particular scenario um, were not uh, appropriate. There were circumstances where they could be, for example, where there's clear evidence of the circumstances where the person would lack capacity or could lack capacity. And also there are practical reasons why a declaration should be made in advance. But in her view, neither of those uh, scenarios applied here. Finally, she was of the view that there was no evidence that would justify an order in the term sought. Um, the expert, Dr. Camden Smith, had inserted that DY's capacity fluctuated. She had actually said that if DUI was provided with support, she, could, she would think that her capacity on this issue would not fluctuate. So having rejected um, the local authorities' application in that regard, um, Mrs Justice Noll then considered whether um, DUI had capacity um, to engage in sexual relations. Now it's quite clear from the judgment that perhaps Mrs Justice Knowles was keen to add to the um, relevant information um, already summarised by Lord Justice Baker. And she asked the, the parties to address her um, whether she was able to do so, given the use of the word may in that paragraph 100. Um, both parties said it would be inappropriate for her to do so, and she accepted that. And also the submission by the official solicitor that the term may potentially actually left open the ability to tailor, to disapply certain um, factors if not deemed relevant. She therefore tempered her enthusiasm to do so. Mrs. Justin Snell came to the view that, um, G, uh, that DY, that she actually um, had capacity to engage in sexual relations. And this sets out um, the reasoning with regards to relevant information. With regards to DY's capacity to understand um, the relevant information as identified by JB, that the person must in fact consent she was of the view that there was no evidence that DUI had any difficulty with understanding that. What's interesting is that in this case, on the face of the judgment, there's no consideration or no express consideration of DUI's ability to understand that the other person has had capacity to consent, 
which of course we saw caused difficulties in the case of HD. Now it might be because in AB, her partner, he didn't have a learning disability and therefore perhaps it was considered not to apply. But it's curious to see that distinction and perhaps there being no specific mention of that, given how it caused a real stumbling block in HD. Um, she then came to the view that um, the additional uh, view that if there were to be any concerns regarding um, DY's capacity going forward, that it was important to remember that the local authority had to take all practical steps to support DY to make a decision before it came to any conclusion that she lacked capacity. And that would involve, for example, putting in place a package of support to limit and or mitigate the effect of distress or unsettledness. So that's my part on the sexual relations. So as we can see, um, there are a number of issues that have been thrown up by JB, in particular, the, um, the ability to understand the capacity to consent to sexual activity. The criminal interface is also, um, the criminal uh, law interface to court protection is also interesting, but different um, standard. Um, is there a different standard? What was Lord Justice Baker perhaps envisaging when he was saying that they must understand, that they must have capacity to consent, and they must in fact consent? And of course, um, what happens when the partner is someone who doesn't have a learning disability? Is it going to play out as it does, as in the case of DY? The case is going to the Supreme Court. It's not known what the grounds are, but hopefully we'll get some clarity from that going forward. So I'm now going to pass over to David, who's going to talk about um, contact. Thank you, Barsha. That was really, really useful and interesting uh, for, for my practice as much as any other, I'm sure. Uh, I'm going to just share my screen now and, as Marsha says, go on to discuss the issue of contact. Uh, it's certainly worth doing that in two forms, I think, uh, sex and contact, because we do see, as in the case of DY, which Varsha just mentioned, uh, that it's it perfectly possible and indeed, in my experience, sometimes somewhat common, actually, to see a decision whereby someone has capacity to make decisions relating to engaging in sex, but doesn't have capacity to make decisions relating to contact. Uh, so it's, it's certainly pertinent that we discuss both. And as I said at the top of this uh, uh, webinar, we, we should, I should think that these will become more and more important and more and more prevalent issues uh, as restrictions in relation to COVID open. So there we go, I'm going to discuss uh, largely in relation to capacity and contact, but I've, I've tacked a couple of extra things on the end for us to, to have a look at as well. So you can see from our list of delegates that I don't need to go too much uh, into the, the background to capacity assessments and the, the relevant tests. Uh, you'll, you'll note there, of course, I've referenced the diagnostic and functional tests in section two and three of the Mental Capacity Act. That's our starting point. Uh, for the basis of time and the expertise of our audience, I don't intend to rehearse those. Uh, what I wanted to look at with you today was the relevant information that applies in relation to contact. Uh, it is, of course, different to that you will have seen uh, referred to in Varsha's presentation in JB. Uh, and we do have a, a bit more of a background case law when it comes to contact. It's not quite as a new and novel as in relation to, to sex. So. As we know, the relevant information is going to depend on the particular decision to be made. We have three particular cases uh, which sets out for us and involves the relevant information relating to making decisions on contact. Those are uh, LBX, uh, B, uh, Capacity Social Media Care and Contact, and B, and a local authority. And I've set out there for you on the slide to have a look at later. Uh, the references to those decisions and indeed uh, what I would term in any event the uh, most pertinent paragraphs of those decisions. Uh, and so if you are in a position where you are either assessing capacity uh, related to contact or considering an assessment and its lawfulness and whether the relevant information was discussed with P, uh, then these are your starting points I would suggest. Uh, what I will go on to do is quickly go through what our, our received wisdom is in terms of assessing contact capacity. So there are three, uh, sorry I apologise, five uh, relevant points to consider. Firstly, 
uh, who they are and in broad terms the nature and relationship with them so p has to understand when use retain information relating to that to begin with uh, secondly a p should be able to understand use way retain what sort of contact she could have with the relevant persons so you could it could be in a number of differing locations as observed uh, in those cases could be for different durations could be for differing arrangements such as the presence of a support worker so supervised unsupervised contact but uh, some understanding of the salient details of the sort of contact uh, is required uh, in my view the most difficult uh, point comes next the positive and negative aspects of having contact with each person and uh, now that can involve a, a huge number of different things of course and it's going to be incredibly case specific uh, what the positive and negative aspects in each end individual case are uh, when assessing capacity but certainly it's a point that needs to be kept in mind uh, and one can see how the positive and negative aspects of having contact with a particular person may be different to consenting to sex it's a far wider uh, uh, consideration that we're dealing with here. Uh, the fourth of those criteria is what in, might be the impact of deciding to have or not to have contact with that particular sort of person. Uh, and then the fifth, uh, in relation to family uh, as a different category, what a family relationship is. So those are the relevant information that I would expect in any capacity assessment to have been discussed with P. Uh, and if you are, as I say, conducting your capacity assessment, then those are the, the, the that's the information I'll be discussing. If I was analysing a capacity assessment, I'd be looking to see that those things have been discussed with P. Uh, I put those things broadly uh, because there are, as always, a huge caveat. Uh, and that huge caveat is, has been uh, set out in B and a local authority in that we know in the vast majority of cases, relevant information is going to be treated as, as guidance to be adapted to the facts of a particular case. So it's always for the capacity assessor to understand what information they think relevant and then discuss that with the protected party. Now, I will caveat my caveat, if I will, and say I would be remarkably reticent if I was a capacity assessor to step away from the relevant information that's just been set out in the previous slide. Uh, uh, I think also it's almost incumbent upon uh, those representing P and local authorities indeed to uh, ensure that they have good reasons if they're not going along with that relevant information we've set out. I think that classic jurisprudence is what you're going to be expecting to see when dealing with capacity and contact. But there is something of a, an additional facet to this, and I get to, to the main aspect of why we think of potentially a, a, a little bit of an update in relation to contact is a good thing. Uh, not just because we uh, will be seeing, I think, more and more contact coming in the coming months and years, uh, but actually because we've got a couple of decisions that will be of relevance uh, coming from the Court of Protection. Uh, the reasoning behind that. Uh, I can take us all the way back to PC and the City of York Council. Now, it's been certainly been said to me when I've been appearing or in discussions with uh, other advocates before court hearings that contact is contact with others and that you are assessing only that, the broad decision-making capacity of someone to have contact with others. Uh, the suggestion has been certainly put to me that it's not appropriate to consider the decision making of someone to have contact with a particular person, a family member, a, uh, a friend, uh, a proposed sexual partner. Um, the reality is, uh, and certainly comes from PC and the City of York Council, is that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, in that case, it was quite clearly set out that uh, for example, as it's been put there, whether P should have contact with a particular individual may be a person specific decision, uh, but all decisions fall to be evaluated within the straightforward and clear structure of the MCA. So really what we're talking about here is a decision needs to be made when you're considering someone's capacity to have contact with others. Are you considering 
simply contact with others or are you considering something a little bit more specific uh, do we need to differentiate between persons and the answer to that is in effect what do the facts of the particular case call for uh, and this is where our, our later cases come into play uh, so we have a consideration of that very issue in the case of EOA uh, a relatively recent case from Mr Justice Williams uh, in that case we were presented with potentially three uh, different types of person with whom P may have contact with. Uh, there were, in effect, two different parts of his family that fell for consideration. Firstly, whether the contact with some of his family members who had a history of subjecting P to extreme religious and antisocial uh, indoctrination. And then there was the other side of the family, as it were, putting it quite broadly, uh, who did not hold those same views. And finally, consideration as to whether contact with others was a, a separate test again. Uh, it was uh, put by the official solicitor in EOA uh, that it was quite proper in line with PC to consider those as separate issues. Uh, and the court in EOA accepted that submission. Uh, and set out applying slightly different criteria for each. So as well as the classic jurisprudence we've referred to above, uh, it would, was re a requirement for P to have capacity that he would need to understand that he would be subject to undue influence and the pernicious effects of exposure to the doctrine uh, in order to be able to make decisions about whether to have capacity, uh, uh, whether, whether make decisions to have contact, I should say with those sides of the family. Uh, the second part, whilst other elements of the family didn't have those strong views, there still was the issue of family dynamics and doctrinal differences. So it was necessary for P to understand in relation to that other side of the family that he, there would be those issues as well. And finally, in relation to uh, strangers, so all others as it were, the classic formulation set out uh, in uh, LBX uh, B and B in the local authority that we saw above could properly be applied. So one can see how when the facts have called for it, the court has been willing and able to consider those different persons in different categories for the issue of assessing capacity. Uh, and you can see how that might take us to, to a number of different places. Uh, a question that hangs in the air is uh, whether it would be in some, whether someone has capacity to make decisions relating to contact with family members who may, for example, uh, hold strong views against vaccination. Uh, it's a, a point that kind of looms large. I can't tell you whether that would be a yes or no. It's going to be case specific, of course. But my point is that you may well find these questions uh, arising. And in EOA, the result of that was that three tailored declarations would be forthcoming relating to uh, P's capacity. As I say, it's an unusual case. Uh, I, I do genuinely think that in the vast majority of cases, you're going to be in a situation where contact is a, a sole question relating to contact with others. But this does illustrate that in certain circumstances, it may be necessary to have those separate considerations. Uh, another example uh, that came up uh, relatively recently, albeit last year, was a local authority and SF, uh, another decision of uh, Cobb J. Uh, I can approach this one slightly uh, quicker, I think, uh, because the differentiation here uh, applied simply as a result of P rather than uh, the necessarily the persons with whom she may be having contact with. Uh, and this all resulted from P's frontal lobe functioning. So there was uh, evidence before the court that P, uh, who wished to have contact with her uh, husband and with others, uh, had a difficulty interpreting subtle verbal and nonverbal cues of others. And as a result of her frontal lobe functioning, uh, the impact on her ability to uh, process information uh, was impacted. That meant that she was unable to appraise the appropriateness of the safety of relationships with ex within existing relationships, but 
outside of existing relationships, she wasn't able to understand that information. So uh, in line with, uh, with SF, you may find a position where the diagnostic and functional tests uh, need to be applied differently uh, because of the actual physical uh, diagnosis uh, applied to P, as we see in this particular case. So we can see there, there are a number of different ways in which uh, it may be appropriate for contact to be assessed separately. Uh, indeed, I was involved in a case uh, relatively recently where uh, it was suggested to the court that, uh, that familiar relationships might well be a reason to assess somebody separately within relation to their capacity. Uh, so it, it is something that can come up, or that, and I mention this as because we have recent cases that have addressed this very issue. Uh, I, I do fall back slightly to say, I think these are likely to be uh, the exception rather than the rule. I also wanted in my time to very briefly mention uh, this case, uh, AMDC and AG, uh, simply because I think it's worth uh, you're going away and, and having a bit of a read of it if you have time. It's a relationship between two care home residents. Uh, it's a case that, that I don't think interestingly comes up as often as I thought it may well do. Um, but certainly it's something that's, that's interesting to me because the court in that particular case, when assessing capacity relating to, uh, in this case, both uh, the relationship between the two residents being uh, proposed to be a sexual one and indeed obviously contact. Uh, being relevant, uh, the court set out in paragraph one how useful a thorough assessment of, and a well-reasoned expert report can assist in the resolution of difficult issues. I put this front and centre because I see it so often uh, and I'm sure the reason the judge put it front and centre in his judgment is because it was seen so often that simply having a well-reasoned and understood capacity assessment at an early stage can really deal with issues very, very well. I mean, and in this case, the unfortunate impact was that it was understood that P didn't have capacity to uh, engage in sexual relations. And as a result, uh, she was pre prevented from sharing intimacy with uh, her partner within a care home as a result of that assessment. Now, if we'd had, if in that case there had been thorough and well-reasoned assessments from a, a, an early stage, then that may not have been the case, and the court was quick to highlight that. So I, I, I pointed out, I think, is an interesting case which sets out quite how useful a little bit more work at the beginning can be in assessing these uh, relationships. I also thought it was an interesting case because it very briefly discusses uh, how said relationships can be facilitated. Uh, uh, should both parties be considered to have capacity. And there's reference to the CQC relationships and sexuality in adult social care services guidance. I think it's worth, uh, certainly worth a read if you're in a position where you're considering best interests in said relationship. Uh, every case is going to be different, uh, but certainly worth a read if you are uh, dealing with a case along these lines. Uh, and I just wanted to raise a couple of points before I pa pass back to Marsha to go through our vaccinations points. Uh, some cases there, I do not intend to go through them all. Uh, simply, I wanted to raise them to say that contact decisions are generally going to be case specific. You have your relevant information, but certainly best interest decisions are going to be incredibly case specific. And it's not going to assist any of you if I simply rattle through the facts and what was decided in these cases. But I put them up there as examples for you all to take away and have a look at should you be dealing with issues along these lines they may may well be useful background reading for you to understand the, the court's process uh, a particularly interesting one actually and i very briefly mention this is is the bottom case uh, which is a local authority in c uh, that's uh, you may well have seen it in uh, mentioned in the press is the, the relatively famous case relating to whether someone uh, where a protected party can have contact with with a sex worker uh, I think it's probably been badly reported because actually if you look at the case all the judge was determining in that case was whether it was potentially lawful to be able to do so. No decisions have actually been made at this stage on best interests. Um, uh, interestingly the answer is yes potentially lawful uh, but I suppose we go back to my point at the top of the slide case specific 
whether it's actually going to be in their best interests. And final point I wanted to mention in relation to contact is a, a frequent issue that I'm seeing uh, and I hope will become less of an issue as we get further and further out of the restrictions we all face and that's care home visits. Uh, it's always a temptation I think to go through and say here's what the guidance tells you, here's what you can do according to the relevant guidance in care homes but the reality is that doesn't assist much for two reasons. One, the guidance will continue to change. So I can go through with you exactly what the guidance says now, that will change soon enough. Uh, one point I do seek to make is, please do be aware, uh, the guidance is different in England and Wales and will presumably continue to change in England and Wales as we open up in terms of restrictions. The key point I wanted to make though, is that if you are representing a protected party or if you're a local authority considering a care homes policy in relation to uh, contact from persons outside of the care home. Uh, blanket policies are, are not particularly well received if I put it that way. I've seen a few uh, certainly last year cases where there have been blanket bans on visits. Uh, whilst I don't say in any way that if the relevant risk assessments are in place that it's uh, it, would, it was at that point impermissible for there to be no visitors coming into care homes. The point was always that it needs to be going back case specific. So uh, each individual care home should have their own uh, policy based on risk assessment and they should have be able to risk assess and consider the best interests of the protected party. So I mention it simply because it's something of a bugbear of mine. Please be aware that contact visits should be allowed in care homes and you're going to be wanting to uh, critically analyse if they're not taking place and the basis upon which they are not taking place. Uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, run through some of the uh, principles of capacity in relation to contact, some of the new case law in relation to capacity on that specific issue and a couple of extra thoughts on the end, if I put it that way, uh, have assisted you with the issue of contact going forward. So uh, there we have it, uh, my email address and uh, Twitter handle, if you're interested in cricket, you'll particularly like the Twitter handle. And I'm going to hand back to Varsha now to go through our last point relating to vaccinations. Thanks. Great. So I'm just going to reshare my screen. Okay, wonderful. Um, right, so vaccines and um, COVID-19 vaccines to be precise. Um, so we have had um, a number of reported judgments um, on this particular issue. Um, a number of these have been before the Vice President, Mr Justice Hayden. Uh, I've listed these here so you can um, go away and perhaps read these in, in more depth should you wish. I'm going to in the remaining time um, run through um, effectively um, some of the law that's been outlined in these cases regarding the issue about capacity, about whether someone has capacity and to consent to COVID-19 vaccination uh, and also the issue of best interests and indeed they do lack capacity in that regard. So uh, moving then to, just bear with me, this seems to have frozen. Okay, there we go. So firstly the issue about capacity. Um, so Mr Justice Hayden in the case of E, and this was the first reported judgment, um, was very helpful in this regard in, in setting out what we're looking at. So he said, evaluating capacity on this single and entirely fact specific issue is unlikely to be a complex or overly sophisticated process when undertaken, for example, by experienced GPs and with the assistance of family members or care staff who know P well. And it's worth looking at the um, at what um, Mr. Justice Hayden considered in that particular case of E. His attention was drawn to an attendance note of a video call between E, um, her ALR, uh, and also her GP, Dr. Wade. Now, this was um, quite a limited um, discussion. Uh, in essence, it set up there. So Dr. Wade asked um, Mrs. E if she remembered her explaining there was a dangerous sickness called coronavirus. And E replied, but she didn't. Um, Dr. Wade then asked her whether she remembered an earlier visit made by both her and a colleague when they came to the care home to deliver injections to protect her against the virus, and E didn't reply. 
Now, Dr. Wade concluded that Mrs. E did not have capacity to determine whether she could receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Mr. Justice Hayden acknowledged the informality of the assessment, but was still satisfied that it was sufficiently rigorous to comply with sections two and three of the Mental Capacity Act. He highlighted that um, she was unable to understand the information concerning the existing the existence of the virus and the potential danger it posed to her health. He was also satisfied that she was unable to weigh the information regarding the advantages and disadvantages of receiving the vaccine. He was also clear that she couldn't retain information long enough to use it and that all of this was because of her dementia, so the diagnostic test being met. Um, he therefore found that she lacked capacity in that regard. In terms of relevant information, um, I've just summarised here what really seems um, to be what the courts are looking for and certainly what um, I've been using when this has arisen in, in my cases. Um, so firstly, the anticipated benefits of vaccination and the likely side effects and any individual risks that might be posed to P in particular. And the disbenefits of not consenting to the vaccination. And also, of course, the number of injections that will be required. So capacity is likely to be something which is going to be um, not particularly overly, overly complicated. However, that said, as David has already highlighted, it's important to um, set out one's reasoning as clearly as possible so that the court can have that information should it go um, to, that, to that level. In terms of best interests, and again, sticking with the case of E, the case law to date have really emphasized that it's P which is at the heart of this. So it's P's wishes and feelings, it's their beliefs, their values. And this case perhaps really makes that crystal clear. So in coming to his determination about what was in an E's best interests, Mr. Justice Hayden looked first under section 4.6 of the act. So he understood he had to consider so far as reasoning ascertainable, the past and present wishes and feelings, beliefs and values that be likely to influence the decision and any other factors should be likely to take into account. What then um, followed was effectively a trawl through the evidence to see what could be found. So looking at her um, situation before her diagnosis of dementia, it was noted that E had always, had always received a flu vaccine uh, and also she had um, received vaccination for swine flu back in 2009 when that had been a problem. This, these were factors which were considered relevant by Mr. Justice Hayden, um, that she chose to be vaccinated in line with public health advice, and whether or not that she had therefore liked and what she would choose to do today if she could make that decision. He also looked at what had happened more recently. Now, when asked by Dr. Wade if she wanted the injection, E had replied twice, whatever is best for me. Now, Mr. Justice Hayden um, was of the view that this articulated a degree of trust in the views of health professionals, which E had, and also the fact that she would act again in, in accordance with public health advice. He felt important to emphasize it because it had in fact been repeated by her uh, uh, twice. Now, of course, under section four, there were also the views of others with an interest in P's welfare to consider. Uh, and these included the views of W, who was E's son. Now, he had been the one who had actually objected to the vaccination, and therefore this application had been brought to the Court of Protection in view of that. His concerns were varied, but also numerous in the sense he was concerned about the efficacy of the vaccine, the speed at which it was authorised, whether it had been adequately tested. He was also of the view that perhaps he wasn't saying no forever, but he just didn't feel it was the right time right now, given that it was such an early stage. Mr. Justice Hayden um, dealt with these views in a way that's perhaps very characteristic of him, in the sense he said, they strike me as a facet of his own temperament and personality, and not reflective of his mother's more placid and sociable character. It is, of course, Mrs. E's approach to life that I'm considering here, and not her son's. Mrs. E remains, as she must do, securely in the centre of this process. So recognising the views of um, E's son, but also making sure they were firmly in the appropriate place for the consideration. 
This is just as Hayden then went on to effectively do a, a risk analysis, considering um, what would a risk to you e um, if she, given the fact um, if she were not to have the vaccine. And there were a number of factors which compounded her vulnerability, for example, her age, the fact she was in a care home, um, underlying health conditions and, and so on. Also, which has been arising in a number of cases regarding dementia, um, the difficulty in actually dealing with social distancing and dealing with perhaps preventative measures, so um, washing hands, wearing masks, those are potentially matters which um, individuals who have dementia may find more troublesome than those who don't. He then came conclusively to the view that it was in her best interest to have the, um, the vaccine and bearing in mind that effectively the risk she faced, um, effectively one of death or serious illness, compared with the risk of perhaps an unknown or an unidentified um, risk of having the vaccine, the balance very much tipped towards her having the vaccine. In the case of SD, um, this involved again Mr Justice Hayden, and, and a very similar approach was adopted um, by him in terms of considering um, these um, wishes and feelings and also the risks which were uh, alive in her particular case. Um, I won't go into any particular detail because those can be read, but what's particularly interesting about this is that um, the view of B's daughter, um, Esty, um, regarding what was appropriate treatment for her mother. She was of the view that the vaccine wasn't appropriate. However, she was incredibly enthusiastic about the use of a drug which is called ivermectin. Now, this is an anti-parasitic drug. And Mr. Justice Hayden um, no noted that she was of no doubt that it would be um, most effectively in protecting her mother, V. Dealing with this, um, he noted that ivermectin had not achieved credibility with any public health authority as a treatment for COVID-19. Um, and in fact, oral ivermectin was an unlicensed treatment for some forms of scabies and other parasites. Um, it's perhaps clear that he was perhaps somewhat puzzled by um, SD's um, endorsement of this, and yet um, her somewhat uh, scepticism regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. But dealing with the issue of differing views regarding treatment, he said, it's not the function of the Court of Protection to arbitrate med medical controversy or to provide a forum for ventilating speculative theories. But his task was to evaluate the situation in light of the authorised, peer-reviewed research and public health guidelines, and to set those in the context of a wider picture of these best interests. He came to the conclusion that it was in these best interests to have the vaccine administered. He was careful to note, though, that whilst in these particular cases, there's likely to be a, a very strong draw to um, vaccination being in someone's best interest. This would not always be the case as the very last case will demonstrate. And certainly there was no presumption that it would always be in someone's best interests. What was required in each and every case was an objective evaluation of P's best interests. And of course, taking into account the centrality of P's voice and her wishes and feelings. The third case, um, CR, um, was different to the others um, which are, have been reported in the sense that um, CR, although he also lived in a, a care home, um, he was far younger, he was in his 30s, whereas the other individuals concerned were in their 70s and 80s. He would also had a lifelong condition, which meant he had always been, he had never been able to express um, wishes and feelings and um, that might be able to assist the court in this particular matter. Um, his ability to communicate was also compromised. He could use Mapaton, um, but in terms of expressing more detailed wishes, um, that there were difficulties with that. The court in this case, um, his honoured judge Butler up in the Northwest, and therefore consider what approach to be taken when you don't have evidence regarding P's wishes and feelings. I should say it wasn't in dispute that P lacked capacity to make this decision. His Honour Judge Butler came to the view that in terms of the factors which would be considered would be um, these which are set out at paragraph 3.5 and I won't go through them, but you'll see from this list it is perhaps a significant focus on what are clinical factors 
um, uh, sort of objective scientific factors. So for example, the vaccination has MHRA approval, um, the impact it would have on the person receiving vaccination in terms of the reduction in their risk. It's interesting to see the Court of Protection use this particular um, evidence in this way. And perhaps it's doing so, or predominantly doing so, with greater weight in absence of there, there being evidence regarding P's wishes and feelings. The final case, the fourth case, um, the case of SS. Now this did come before Mr Justice Hayden um, because it was the first time where the objections to the vaccine came from P themselves. Um, she had consistently and um, very strongly objected to receiving the vaccine. She was an 86 year old woman and had a diagnosis of dementia. Um, the GP who had assessed her at various points considered that such was her opposition, she was likely to need restraint if the vaccination was to occur. This case demonstrates again a um, court putting um, P at the centre of the determination of best interests. Um, there was dispute as to what um, she would have done if she had been capacitous. Um, Mr Justice Hayden came to the view that there was substantial material to conclude but if capacitous, actually, she would have likely declined vaccination, as of course is, is her right to do so. He noted that as she was now, she was of course opposing the vaccine quite loudly, quite consistently. And he noted that whilst this reality was undoubtedly delusional, that didn't stop it being her reality. And therefore that still had to be both recognized and respect. And I think that's a very key aspect in the sense, it may well be, of course, that what's underlying those particular views is perhaps not based in reality. In this case, um, P seemed to have concerns which stemmed far back regarding um, whether medicine can do any good for anybody. But it is still her reality and there is still therefore real fear she would face if she was to be forced to have something which she didn't want to have. It also, this, in this case, um, emphasised the importance to look at the issue of welfare in the broad sense, not just looking at the medical aspects of the health issues. And um, the CCG in this matter had urged Mr Justice Hayden to consider it was in her best interest to have the vaccine. He considered it would have been if he was just looking at epidemiological factors. But as Baroness Hale had said, we had to look at welfare in the widest possible um, context. And then also regarding the issue of restraint, um, there was a concern that there would be need for restraint. And as one um, carer put it, it would not be so much gentle restraint, but rather there'd have to be Kung Fu experts. And no doubt, therefore, there would have to be a considerable, um, the risk of considerable restraint um, arose. The carer concerned, Ms. Fisher, didn't think it was appropriate that the carers would be involved in providing that restraint it put them in this rather invidious position where potentially SS would be looking to them um, for help, but they wouldn't be able to actually provide it. And that would be both distressing for her and also the carers. It could also risk um, effectively uh, removing any trust which had been built up um, painstakingly over recent time between um, SS and carers, which would of course be very detrimental um, going forward. Um, Mr Justice Hayden um, was convinced by this and um, took the view uh, in accordance also with the local authority and the ALR on um, SS's behalf that considering best interests in the broader sense, it couldn't be said to be in SS's best interests and therefore um, he made no such um, determination. And then finally, just in regarding to the procedural um, aspects, um, so applications to the Court of Protection uh, and when these should be brought, by whom, and also who's, listen, who's hearing them. So we had had a, a number of cases for um, tier three judges, Mr Justice Hayden, when it was a relatively new um, issue which was arising and the courts were grappling with how it should be determined. Um, now these are usually being heard by tier one and also tier two judges. In terms of when the application is to be brought, and Mr Justice Hayden, SD, highlighted that where there is issues and regarding this which can't be resolved, that a matter needs to be brought to the court expeditiously. Now that's because not only of the issue of risk um, regarding um, not being vaccinated, 
but also the obligation to protect people's autonomy, which is central, of course, to the Mental Capacity Act. In terms of who should be bringing the application, um, it seems the body with clinical responsibilities, for example, the CCG, um, would be appropriate, although there are, of course, cases with the local authority, and of course the local authority has safeguarding duties, um, so that is perhaps um, why that is arising. However, in the case of SD, it was actually SD who brought the application, um, and it was actually then an application which was opposed by the local authority. So we're seeing a, a range of actors um, in this particular arena. So that's our, that's our presentation on um, sex, contact and COVID. Um, we've gone a little over um, for time, but I just want to quickly check, see if there are any questions. I, David, I'm not sure if you've been seeing any of these whilst... Uh, I've had a look, Raj, but I don't think it will, I think they're quite specific. So I think we can probably deal with those quite quickly. Hopefully, if everyone's happy to hang on for five minutes, we'll address those three. Uh, uh, do you want to me to perhaps start off with the first couple of hours because I think the third one is likely to be uh, addressed on your presentation. Uh, so we've got a, 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 if you're happy with that, Varsha, anyway. <laughs> yes, sorry, um, what are you referring to? Um, the first point I think is from, from, from Peter. Uh, the phrase relevant information is so important because to state the obvious must mean that there is also irrelevant information. Practitioners need to record in best interest decisions what information has been considered and perhaps what was excluded. Uh, I can deal with that quite, quite briefly. I agree, Peter. Um, yes, it's, it's certainly really frustrating if you have a case where you've got an assessment where it's not clear what relevant information was discussed uh, and uh, it makes it so difficult to, to, to accept the conclusions uh, as evidence. So, so yes, I entirely agree. Uh, whether you, you consider what to, information to exclude, uh, I don't think perhaps is as such a such concern, but certainly if it's pertinent, pop it down. Uh, so I hope that helps. Uh, the second uh, relates to, uh, uh, from an anonymous attendee, who would you recommend for a capacity assessment in these matters, particularly where capacity to consent fluctuates due to the client's conditions? And certainly if, you, if it's, you're dealing with a, uh, a, a diagnostic issue, as it were, I think probably looking for a, a clinical psychologist to undertake the assessment is the reality. And looking at those other cases, hopefully a good one who can set, set out exactly what their reasoning was. Uh, you wouldn't, would you disagree with that, Varsha? Any, any further points on, on who you would instruct? I don't think it's, it's incumbent upon me to, to suggest particular names, it's probably not wise. No, <laughs> no, no, probably not. Um, I, I think I think that's, I think you've addressed that, David. So I'm just, I'm, I'm looking ahead at the, the next question as well. Um, so just in terms of, so again, just conscious of time, I don't want to keep any people longer than, than necessary. Um, you may cover this further in slides, um, but do you have a view on whether it's the health or local authority responsibility to bring an application to court for a dispute with family members regarding whether it's in peace best interest to have a vaccine? Um, action for local authority we're experiencing GPs referring to the local authority on a safeguarding basis um, for the local authority to bring to the court rather than pursuing this themselves. Um, I, I think so the first answer is effectively the application has to be brought expeditiously. Um, and, and so for example I have a case which is coming up in the next couple of weeks um, where there have been a number of um, act, a number of people concerned, so for example, obviously the care home and the GP, it's been a, a sort of quite multidisciplinary approach. Um, but it's ultimately actually the local authority which has brought it. it. It seems in absence of there being someone else obvious who can do so. Um, so I would certainly say um, if it seems that the only uh, party which is in fact um, the local authority um, is able to bring the application and the local authority should be bringing the application. In, in terms of evidence, of course, um, it may well be that the local authority will need to wrangle evidence from um, appropriate health individuals. Um, so, for example, to try and get um, evidence from the GP regarding um, 
evidence that will go into that best interest analysis. So what are those um, advantages for P? What are the particular disadvantages? So as it relates to P's condition, is there anything which is going to cause any difficulties here? And certainly um, in cases we're seeing that that's sometimes what family members are concerned about. They're concerned about the fact that it's going to have some sort of adverse effect. Um, so the court will look to health to provide that. Uh, and in my experience to date, when the local authority has brought this, and um, they've been able to get evidence from the GP and the GP has been very obliging and, and has done so. But I would say certainly it's a case of um, not waiting. If there's an application to be brought and no other obvious um, body to bring it, then um, the local authority should probably step in. Okay. Are there any other questions? Great. I think so. Well, then we can draw things to a close about 10 minutes after five. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for coming and apologies for overrunning slightly. Um, we hope that's been helpful providing um, an update just in regarding some of these really um, difficult issues that are, you know, that are challenging the court of protection at the moment. So regarding um, sex, um, contact, um, the ever-emerging, ever-evolving COVID um, situation. Um, there is a lot happening um, and what we're all trying to do, it seems, is try and keep up with it. Um, sometimes there are big step changes like in JB where effectively Lord Justice Baker pressed the reset button, but then what follows is effectively how that plays out um, on the ground um, when things are looked at it in more detail. So no doubt we'll see more evolution uh, going forward. Um, please do um, fill out the feedback form, which I understand has been added to the chat function. Um, we'll be very grateful for your thoughts and also any suggestions about what you would think would be useful for future um, webinars. Um, in terms of um, these slides and also this recording, um, they will be sent um, after the webinar. There'll have to be some um, digital trickery that goes on regarding um, putting all the video footage and the audio together. So um, please be patient, that will probably come um, in due course, but the, the slides will probably come quite promptly. But otherwise, thank you very much. And if you do have any questions which you haven't felt able to raise today, um, then you do have our email addresses. Um, and you can feel, of course, free to get in touch. Okay, thank you, everybody. Good evening. Thanks, everyone.